as we forgave our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, a very good evening to everyone. Uh, we thank the Lord Jesus first and foremost for uh, giving us this opportunity to be together, uh, sharing His Word, which is the Word that is eternal, full of life, joy, happiness, you name it. We ask the Lord Jesus always for His guidance. We ask the Lord Jesus always for His protection. We ask the Lord Jesus always to teach us and give us the insight to His divine wisdom, divine love, and divine mercy, so that we imitate Him in every step we take in our life, and in every, talk, in every word we say, and in every decision we make in our lives. Let that be all to your glory and your glory only, my Lord Jesus, because no one is worthy but you are. We thank you, Lord, for dying for us. We thank you, Lord, for rising for us. And we thank you, Lord, for being there for us, whether we are with you or away from you. You never leave us alone and deny us, never. So we thank Jesus all the time. Amen. Amen. Ah, come on, shout to the Lord. You know what? Never be shy when it comes to Jesus Christ. Never. We shout for people. We shout for famous people, whether, whatever they are and their positions are, with all, with all the love and respect for them. But when it comes to Jesus, we need to really shake the ground beneath us for Him because He is worthy of every shout and every joy and every trembling. All right, tonight, my beloved, uh, we are going to Psalm number 133, and we are almost there to finish our series of talks about the Song of Ascents, and we have read Psalm number 133. We're going to read together. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the bead, the bead of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dough of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings, life forevermore. Amen. And glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we talked about Psalm number 132, and we said if we want to give it a title, we give it cringing before the Lord Jesus. And we said the word cringing means going beyond humility. Psalm number 130, self-denial. Psalm number 131, humility. Psalm number 132, cringing. Um, cringing, I can give it another word. And this is not a, a literal definition of the word, no, but cringing, a closer word so you can understand what cringing is, emptiness. I empty myself before the Lord. So I die to myself, Psalm 130, I deny myself. And then when I die to my old person to live in the new Christ who has resurrected me from the dead, then I come and walk in humility before Him. Psalm 131. And when I walk in humility, I need to step up the ladder to Psalm 132, and I live before the Lord in total emptiness so that I can read Psalm 131 in His mercy. And Psalm 131, if I want to give it a title, it is the Psalm of fullness. I need to empty myself in order to be filled by the Lord Jesus. 
You see, the more I deny myself, the more I lower myself and humble myself, the more I become empty of my own self. And the more I become empty of my own self, the more I get filled by Jesus Christ, by the power of His Holy Spirit. And we find this very clear in the, in the book of Joel. Joel is one of the prophets of the Old Testament, and more specific, chapter 2, verse 28. The Lord God says through Joel, He says, In the end of times I will pour out my Spirit upon your sons and daughters, the young and the old shall see visions and dreams. But the Lord God says through Joel the prophet, I will pour out my spirit. Now the word pouring only applies to water. The Lord God says that I will pour out my spirit. Water illustrates or represents symbolically the spirit of God. Why? Because there is one thing in water that illustrates the Spirit of God, and that is water can only do one thing, is to go down. The movement of water, I've never, you've never seen water going uphill. Water always goes downhill. And whenever, in the good old days, uh, in the farming fields, whenever they wanted to get water to a dry spot or a dry land, if the land was higher than the level of water, then they used to start digging into that ground, breaking it, breaking it, breaking it, and making it lower than the level of water so that water can get to that dead, dry land and become fertile. So water only goes downwards, and the Lord God says, my spirit can only come down, pour. Pour me a glass of water. When you hold a jug and you want to pour it into a glass, the jug has to be higher than the level of the glass. Otherwise, the water is, you cannot empty it into the glass. So God says, my spirit can only go downward. It cannot go upward because I am the supreme authority. I am the highest level. No one is higher than, than I. Therefore, I can only do one thing. I come down. And the only way I can come down is when you lower yourself, humble yourself, deny yourself and empty yourself because unless you're empty I can't fill you you cannot come to Jesus and say Lord you know I've got everything I can do everything well Jesus is gonna say you're leaving me no room my son and my daughter you need to come to me empty so I can fill you with everything I have and that's why when you lower yourself it is that ground that being cut, that's being broken. And blessed are you when you start feeling the pain and you go through hardships for the sake of Jesus Christ because all those hardships are cutting into this human being and it's lowering your spirit, lowering your soul, lowering your entire being it, and getting you to a level where God now can, can pour out His Spirit and fill you with His wisdom, with His love, and all the good things that He has and possesses. Empty yourself so that you may be filled with the Spirit of God. When I'm emptying myself and coming to the Lord Jesus, I find that in the, um, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, and verse 3, Gospel of Matthew, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not say, Blessed are the rich. He said the poor. Why? Because poor is empty. Rich is full. He says, You want to come to me? You better come empty. Because no one can give you richness. No one can give you wealth. No one can give you health. No one can give you life eternal except Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the only way to receive it from me, you humble yourself, lower yourself, then empty yourself so that my spirit can come down upon you and fill you with all the richness of the other world. So it is the, um, the song of ascent, Psalm 133, the fullness to be filled by God. Look at this. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How nice, how beautiful it is when brothers live in unity together. There is no greater thing than this. There is nothing more precious than brothers, sisters living in harmony and peace with one another. You know, when you see, when you see a place that there is fighting, arguments, hatred, envies, friction, it's an ugly sight. It's an ugly sight. And I don't think anyone would like to see that kind of sight. But imagine when you go to a place and you see everybody is so friendly, everybody is so cheerful, everybody is so um, living in harmony with one another, you feel already at peace and at ease. That environment in its own gives you that comfort of mind, of heart, and of soul. So the psalmist is encouraging everyone and saying, it is so beautiful and pleasant to live in, in unity. Why it is so pleasant to live in unity? Because that's what Jesus came for. That's what Jesus came to fulfill and accomplish, and not only to do that, but give us that peace and that unity. John 17, the Lord Jesus is talking to His Daddy, His Heavenly Father. He says, Father, just like I and you are one, united, I want them, meaning us, I want them to be one in us. Unity is one of the main reasons why Jesus came. Jesus actually came to unite us to Him in matrimonial unity, a wedding, a marriage unity. And in marriage, you see that in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning of the Holy Bible, in the Old Testament, God said, let these two be one. What God has united, let no one separate. I always say this, the mathematics of God is always different to the mathematics of the world. You know, we've all gone to school, and some of us are still in school. They teach you in maths. One plus one equals two. That's the mathematics of the world. But look at God's mathematics. God says one plus one equals one, but a much better and stronger one. When the two become one, they become stronger. When the two are separated, are weak. The more you separate people, the weaker they become and vulnerable. And you can control them easier. But when they are united, you can never break them or divide them. And they become a power and a very dangerous power. Jesus Christ says, your strength, your power is when you are united to me. And I came to give you that unity. With me, it is a marriage unity where, where you and I and I and you become one, inseparable. And through me, I unite you to my heavenly dad. God becomes your father through Jesus Christ. But then again, in the epistle of St. John, St. John the Beloved, who talks about love, his epistle is all about love, his gospel is all about the, the divine love. He comes and says, if you do not love the brother that you see with your own eyes, how can you love God whom you can never see? How can you love Him? You see, we lie. <laughs> I'm lying to Jesus. I'm saying, God, I love you. God, I worship you. God, I adore you. God says, have you seen me? No. Well, how can you love someone you've never seen? I have given you my image and likeness in your brother. You see your brother, you see me. So do you love your brother? No, I can't stand him. If I had the opportunity, I would have chopped his head off. Then God says, well, what kind of love is that? So the one you see with your eyes, you cannot love. How can you love the one you cannot see with your eyes? I'm lying now before the Almighty God. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We're living in a time and age where the world has gone all about materialism. Money talks. Materialistic lifestyle has overshadowed everything that is of value and, and good principles. Christian ethics. It is so sad that the... Uh, the discussions of, of these days is all about materials, money, what I own, what I have, 
what I'm capable of building, what I'm capable of achieving, um, I've got this, I've got that, uh, and what I wear, what kind of car I drive, what kind of lifestyle I maintain. It's all about this kind of talks. Spirituality has diminished so much that when you talk about Jesus Christ, they think there is something wrong with you. Or they call you names. Oh, he or she is so ignorant, man. Where do you think you're living? You think you're living in Bashiqa or somewhere like in the good old Stone Age? This is not Iraq. This is 21st century Australia, bro. Wake up. Money talks, brother. When you sit in a Mercedes-Benz convertible and you go downtown, everybody's going to salute you. You go downtown and talk about Jesus, everybody's going to make fun of you. So do you want me to look like an idiot before people? Come on, man. It's all about image. Maintaining that image. But there is no greater image than the image of Jesus Christ. Every image will vanish. Every image, every image will come to an end and will, will perish altogether with no comeback. Only one will remain forever, Jesus of Nazareth. Blessed is the soul that imitates this image. Materialistic lifestyle has caused a lot of division and friction because when money enters, that image enters, and image becomes myself. I become, everything has to revolve around me because it's all about me. My image, my reputation, my dignity, my position. So it becomes about me. When it comes about me, then I will not allow no one to take the place of me. And I will fight. I will go to the extreme to make sure that no one will ever challenge me, stand in my way, or be a threat to my position. And that's exactly what's happening in the world. Uh, St. Paul says it in his epistle, the roots of all evil is the love of money. Because why is St. Paul saying the roots of all evil is the love of money? He, he adds the word love to money. He did not say the roots of all evil is money. No, because there is nothing wrong with money, by the way, guys. Money is also a mean provided by God to everyone. But he says when you put love to it, then it becomes the roots of all evil. Because love, St. Paul says, was meant to be for God and God only. You shall love your God with all your heart, your mind, and then love thy neighbor like yourself. But if you love anything outside God, then that thing or that person becomes God. So when you love money, money becomes your God. And when God is your money, or, or when money is your God, then you will kill to maintain that God. But when Jesus is your God, then you will kill yourself to maintain the people around you. The world is full of evil because their God, honey, 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 make me money in this big wide world. You know, I, I wonder, why, why would uh, a superpower go into Iraq? Why didn't they go to uh, Sudan? Millions of Sudanese have been slain. Did anybody give one penny about them? No. Why did they go into Iraq? Money, bro. How beautiful it is when brothers live in, in unity. Now, we'll come to this other point. You see, my beloved, Satan tries to do two things to everyone especially those people who follow Jesus Christ. Oh, he doesn't like them at all. He despises them the most. Because when you have Jesus in you through baptism, when you have put on the, the Christ, as St. As Paul mentions in Galatians 3.27, uh, you who, who have been baptized into Christ have put on the Christ. Those who are baptized into Jesus Christ, Satan hates the most. So if you get into sometimes trouble and mischief in life and hardships, you know, it's a good sign that you are walking in Jesus' path. If things are going easy with you, put a huge question mark to where you're heading because you may not be walking in the path of Jesus Christ if everything is going easy. That's a dangerous thing <laughs> to have. So, Satan will do two things to Christians. One, he will do everything in his power to stop you from going to church. 
He will do everything and put every hindrance, every obstacle, every chain, you name it, to push you away from Jesus Christ and His house, the church. So one day you want to go and then you get up and all of a sudden you don't feel like it. Come on, let's go to church. Oh, I'm tired. Come on, let's go to church. You know what? I just remembered I've got something to do this Sunday. Can I leave it please to next Sunday? But if I say Mariah Carey is singing in Sydney Stadium, I'll drop everything, even myself. And I'm all for Mariah Carey. She's got a nice voice. But if I don't have Jesus, then everything is not one big empty thing. So I find excuses. These excuses that I find, Satan puts him in my way, in my thoughts. I read the Bible, I start, you know, twisting my head around and my eyes go so heavy. Have you, have you try, you've tried it? Huh? You've experienced this. All of a sudden, you got sleep. I was watching TV. I was fine. The moment I opened the Bible, I'm going to sleep. I'm so heavy headed. I can't hold myself. What happened? Satan doesn't want you to read the Bible because he knows the moment you read the Bible, he can't win with you. But you watch TV. He's got you, brother. He's got you. He says, yeah, I'll give you the energy. I'll give you the V, bro, and the Red Bull. Drink. Don't drink those drinks. They're very bad for you. Don't drink them, huh? Every time Satan puts a hindrance for you not to be with the Lord Jesus, whether going to church, reading the Bible, you know, doing some good, good things, feeding the homeless, whatever it is, obstacles come your way. But if you are stubborn, and it is good when you are stubborn for the Lord's sake. Man, you say, Satan, no matter what you do, it is a thundery day, it's pouring down, it is cold, it's a miserable weather, but I'm going to church, I'm going to Bible studies. You're not winning with me, Satan, I'm going. And then you come to church, and you come to Bible studies. Satan has lost the first battle. Do you think he's going to give up? No. One thing, if we want to learn from our enemy, Satan, learn one thing, patience. He's very patient. He will wait for years and years and years just to get you. So when, when he loses the first battle and you come to church and to Bible studies, he's going to get engaged into the second one. What is he going to do? Inside the church, he's going to turn the brothers into enemies. How good and pleasant it is when brethren are to dwell together in unity. Satan will infiltrate and start planting the seed or the weed of division. The fighting starts to happen from inside the church. <laughs> he didn't win outside. He's going to try and win inside. All of a sudden, you're sitting in this chair, for example, and, and somebody walks in and says, excuse me, can you get up? This is my chair. I'm just giving you an example. huh? No, I'm sitting. Is your name on the chair? No, but this is what I said every Sunday. And you just took my place. Can you move, please? And before you know it, an argument erupts and then builds up and they don't talk to each other anymore. My goodness. <laughs> Can happen very easily. Even with people like us. Oh, the problem is when it starts with us, you know. <laughs> That's a bigger problem. We need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. Um, my advice to you in the spiritual life, listen to this. Some of you are still very young, but those who are you know, mature enough, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. In the spiritual realm, you need to have a very big heart and a very big mind and a very deep thinking and a very far away insight. So when something happens now, do not make any decision on what happened now. You see, Satan will try to upset you so that while you are upset, you make a decision. And you'll say, I will never talk to this person. I will never say hello to this person. And I will never go to this church anymore. For as long as that person is in that church, I'm not going to be there. Bless you. That, is, should, that should not be the case. We need to have a very big heart and we need to be patient. In spirituality, 
it is, it is a, it's a life journey. It is not just about today, I am, I am in good spirit, I am very strong in faith, and I'm very close to the Lord Jesus, and that's it, I've made it. No, 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 you haven't made it. Great saints, mighty saints, they said, I will never say I made it until the day Jesus calls me to Him and releases the Spirit from this cage. And then when I'm sitting at, at the right hand of Jesus, then I will say I've made it. But until then, for as long as I'm in the flesh, I will always ask for Jesus' mercy, for His wisdom to guide me, to protect me, because I can slip very easily. So Satan will try to cause division inside the church. He could not stop you from coming in. He's going to stop you from coming again. Or at least come with a grumpy look. You pray and you say, and you, you, say, you say that our Father, and forgive us our, our debts as we forgave. And then when you turn around and you see that guy who has upset you, and I say, I will never forgive that person. <laughs> and then Jesus says, I will never hear your prayer because your prayer is obsolete, is invalid, has no place. I cannot hear your prayer because you're saying, Jesus, forgive me my sins as I forgave who those who have gone against me, and you are not forgiving them. Then if you can't forgive your brother, how can I forgive you? What goes around comes around. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. That's why when, if anything happens, you know, between you guys here in the church, wherever you are, have a big heart. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever allow yourself for Satan to put any ugly picture in your head against no one or towards anyone. Don't ever picture an ugly, an ugly image about any person. Don't ever do that because you're going to look ugly, not that person. You're going to look ugly before God. No matter how much they've hurt you, no matter how much they've gone against you, no matter what they've done and what they said, always maintain the image of Jesus. Father, Forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Jesus maintained the beautiful picture and that image of God in the human side of Him. He never stained it. He never put any blemishes on it. So whatever happens, always allow the chance for reconciliation. Always allow the chance for a comeback. Always allow a chance for an open door. Don't ever shut the door. Don't ever shut the door. Otherwise, the Lord Jesus will shut the door in our face when we go and beg Him for mercy. It's a long topic. Don't have the time to go through everything. How pleasant it is, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the bead, the bead of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the precious oil upon the head. Precious oil is the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is represented through different materials and different things. Water, oil. Um, when, they, when they used to um, anoint a king or a priest in the Old Testament, they would, an, well, they would use that oil to be anointed as a king or a priest. And even now, in the, in the church, in an apostolic church, uh, we use that holy oil representing the Holy Spirit. When we baptize a child or a person, we use that holy oil, anointing. Christ is the anointed one. The word mshicha or mshicha or mshicho, the word mshicha means anointed. It's, a, it's an Aramaic Hebrew word. Now, Hebrew comes from Aramaic. It's an Aramaic word, in, uh, the origin of it, Aramaic or Syriac. So mshicha or mshicho or mshicha means anointed, the anointed one. The one who was rubbed all over by the Holy Spirit. So Christ is the anointed, is the one who was rubbed all over by the Holy Spirit. He is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And he was anointed to become king, to be king and priest at the same time. So it is like the precious oil that is coming down on the head, running down to the beard, 
the beard of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses, and Aaron was chosen by the Almighty God to be a priest and his sons for God and the tabernacle of God. So he says, it is like when brothers live in unity, it is like this unity is like oil, precious oil, Holy Spirit coming down on the head, on the beard, and going down where? To the edge of the garment. That means from head to toe, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Unity means we are full of the Holy Spirit because God is only present in full force where there is unity and love. God cannot show Himself in full force when there is division because He is the God of unity, not division. Satan divides, God unites. So when we live in unity, and that unity needs to start first between you and God, then between you and your brother, and then goes out to the outer and the bigger picture with the community and the society and the country you live in. If I'm not united with God, I can't be united with my own self so that I can be therefore united to the person that is next door to me. But what I need to do is I need to ask God in order for me to be united with the invisible God, allow me God to be united with the visible person that is next door to me. It is like that precious oil, the Holy Spirit, comes down on the head. Three things the Holy Spirit does. Head, beard, and then, look at this. Running down on the edge of His garments. In English, it's not so clear. It is running down through the collar and down to the pocket and then to the edge of the garment. Coming down from the head to the collar, to the pocket, to the edge of the garment and other translations, which is more accurate. Now, the Holy Spirit, when God fills us up, when we come empty, when we empty ourselves before God, He will fill us up in three things, in three ways. The head, the bead, and the pocket. The head is the place where your thought is. The beard is the place where your dignity is. The pocket is the place where your heart is. Because normally, and normally, and usually, the pocket is always on the left-hand side, yeah? Why? Because I don't use my left hand to get into the pocket. I use my right hand. And when I use my right hand, my right hand is going to go all the way to the other side, to the left. Now, that pocket represents the place of your heart. He is saying, when you come to me empty, em when you empty yourself and you lower yourself, I will fill you with my thought. I will fill you with my dignity. And I will fill you with my love, the heart. The heart is the place where the feelings and the emotions are. The feelings and the emotions are. Jesus Christ says, I will fill you with my love. I will give you my feelings and my emotions. And I will give you my thought. When you have Jesus' way of thinking, when you have Jesus' way of loving, then you will have the dignity of Jesus Christ. For a man, his dignity is the bead. For a woman, her dignity is her hair. You know, Mary Magdalene, when the Lord Jesus was invited into this house of Simon, and then Mary came, and she started crying. She started washing the feet of our Lord Jesus with her own tears. And then she started wiping those, those feet with her hair. I mean, she could have used a cloth or at least her dress because they used to dress up in a very long dresses in those days. And I think you should maintain that, girls, just like Marmari. Um, she could have used like a, a part of her, of her dress or a cloth or something or handkerchief, whatever. But she decided to use her hair to wipe his feet. Why? Because she said to Jesus through this action, she says, my entire dignity, my entire pride, I put it under your foot, my Lord. So, when you have the thought of Christ, the head, when you have the love of Christ, you are going to walk in the dignity of Jesus Christ, not your dignity. Is there a difference? 
huge. What is the difference? My dignity, no one can touch. Hey, you tell me one nasty word, I'll give you a hundred back. You slap me once, I slap you a hundred times. No one messes with my dignity. Anybody touches me, I wipe him from existence. That is me. But if you have the thought of God, Jesus, and if you have the heart of Jesus, then you are not walking with your own dignity, you are walking with His dignity. So His dignity is two things. What is the dignity? Is the cross. The cross has the right and has the left. The left being dragged in the streets. The left is being, being ridiculed. The left is being humiliated. The left is being kicked, punched, and nailed on the cross. The right resurrected all glory. So when you walk in His path, with His way of thinking, with His kind of heart and love, then I'm walking in His dignity. When people tell me off, I bless them because they told my master off before me. Who am I compared to Jesus if the Holy of Holies was called so many ugly things? Then who am I the sinner not to be called ugly things? Who am I? Compared to Jesus, I'm nothing but a piece of my new dust, full of mistakes, full of errors. If the perfect Jesus was ridiculed, then it is only normal for me to be ridiculed. But when I'm walking in His dignity, then my dignity is no longer in existence. Then I will accept what came in Jesus' way. I will accept it likewise to come in my way. When I'm told off, when I'm kicked out, when I'm thrown out of a place, when I'm being disrespected, all I'm going to say, Jesus, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the cross with you and to give me this chance to live what you have lived and accept it for my salvation, I the sinner. And when people come and respect me, when people come and glorify me, when people come and show love, and when people come and give me a helping hand, all I can say, I'm not going to have a big head full of self-pride. All I'm going to say, all glory be to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for giving me that portion of yours as well. So when people tell me off, I'm not going to lose hope. And when people glorify me, I'm not going to have a big head like a balloon and fly high and say I'm the only one and no one else. I'll be steady Eddie, walking my distance. And that's what John the Baptist said. That's what John the Baptist said when, when the, 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 the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees came and asked him, who are you? He said, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way before the coming of the Lord. For the mountains shall be lowered and the valleys shall be lifted, shall be filled and lifted up. And the crooked way shall be made straight. For the one who comes after me is before me and his path is straight. It is neither a mountain nor a valley nor crooked. It is absolutely straight. Mountain self-pride, valley, losing hope, steady, walking in faith, the dignity of Jesus Christ. Jesus never lost hope when they told him off. He never had false glory when they glorified him. He says, because I came to make my heavenly daddy happy, I came for him. Everything I do is for his glory. Everything I say, it is for my dad. Do not say, Lord, Lord, don't ever think you're going to enter the kingdom of God by saying, Lord, Lord. He who does the will of my heavenly dad will enter the kingdom of God. Don't love me, love my daddy, because I came for him. That's why whatever you say to me, whether it's good or bad, it's not going to affect me one tiny bit. I'll keep on walking my steady, fast path. That is the dignity of Jesus. Don't be angry and retaliate when people are go, they go against you. Leave it in the Lord's hand. Let Him fight the, the good fight for you. All you say, pray. And ask the Lord to touch their hearts because they're blinded by Satan. Don't get angry. Let go. Forgive, but that does not mean you need to live with them and, and be with them. If they are friends, relatives, people outside your, your immediate family, you must forgive, but that does not mean you mix with them. If they are drifting you away from Jesus, don't be with people that drift you away from Jesus. You do your best. Try and give them the right food. But if they don't want to eat that food, don't push it. 
And don't walk with them because they might drift you away from God. Walk away, but love them and pray for them and forgive them. But you can walk away. You can walk away. It is like the precious oil coming upon the head, thought, upon the bead, dignity, and upon the pocket, and all the way to the edge of the garment. That means you will be filled with Jesus' spirit from head to toe. If we can get to this level, nothing will ever stand in my way. Nothing. Because when I talk, it is Jesus talking. Some saints were filled to an extreme level of spiritual fill, you know, fullness. So when they, when they said something, it was done on the spot. And when they saw a demented uh, soul, it uh, was possessed by demons, just to look at it, at that soul, the demon was gone. Because they saw Jesus Christ, not that guy. That guy is nothing. Satan can do whatever to anyone. But when you are filled with Jesus, oh, it's totally a different thing. He can't touch you. And when they prayed on a sick person on the spot, they're healed. And so many wonders. It is like the door of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. When we live in unity, we are filled by the Holy Spirit, and then we become like the door of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. My beloved, Hermon is a mountain much higher than the Mount of Zion. And Hermon is a mountain in the north of Israel. Israel, which is in the Middle East. Mount of Hermon is still there. Mount of Hermon is in the north. Mount of Zion is in the south. He's saying it's like the door descending from the Mount of Hermon because Mount of Hermon is what? Higher than the Mount of Zion. So descending means pouring down. Mount of Hermon is in the north. Mount of Zion is in the south. But he says it is like when you are united in the love of Jesus Christ, when you are filled by His Holy Spirit, it is like that door that came down from the Mount of Hermon in the north to the Mount of Zion in the south. And my question is, can the north ever meet the south? It is impossible. So this is metaphoric. There is no such thing as door coming down from Mount of Hermon to Mount of Zion. They are too far away. Two different directions. Totally separated and opposite directions. The Lord God, when He's trying to explain about Himself that I am the... Uh, I can never be reached, I can never be fully understood. He says, just like the heaven is higher or above and further away from the, from the earth, so as my thoughts are far away from you. And just like the east is so far away from the west, and like the north from the south, so as my ways are totally different to your ways. So what is he trying to say here then, the psalmist? He says, when you, are, when you live in unity, and when you are filled by the Spirit of God, even the impossible becomes possible. Because what is impossible to men is possible to God. Nothing stands in God's way. No matter how divided you are, no matter how far away you are, no matter how indifferent you are, but when you are filled with my Spirit, this gap, humongous gap that can never meet, these two parallel lines that can never become one, I, the Almighty God, will make the parallel lines become one line. When you leave it in my hand, I'll do the impossible because I am to be known the wondrous and the Almighty. I can do things you can never dream of. Leave it in God's hand, my beloveds. Leave it in God's hand. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Where did, where did the Lord command the blessing? Mount Zion. And Mount Zion, the Lord commanded His blessings to be on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the church, represents the church, and the church is you. For there the Lord commanded, it is an order, my blessings will be on Zion. Zion is you. You are Zion. He says, this is the only place that I am well pleased with. And this is the place where my blessings will be coming upon you, my beloved child. I love you more than myself. 
I created you in my image and likeness, and I called you before the creations of the worlds to be the heirs to my kingdom, to my throne, and the inheritors of my kingdom. I wanted you to be my children. No one comes anywhere near you. The angels, yet so powerful, so awesome, so holy, so perfect, are nothing but servants. You are my sons and daughters. Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, you read in the Old and the New Testament. When they talk, they always say, I, the Archangel Michael, who stands in the presence of the, of the Lord God. I, the Archangel Gabriel, who stands in the presence of, of the Almighty God. And you go to the book of Revelation chapter 4, and you see John the Beloved being taken by Jesus into heaven. And he says, I saw the throne of God and God sitting on that throne, Jesus Christ. And I saw 24 elders, human being like us, sitting in the presence of the Almighty God. Why? Because servants cannot sit when their master is there, but children can sit when their daddy is present. Barack Obama, any president, any king, when they go and give a talk, everybody stands when they come in. But the same president and the same king, when they go home, the son and the daughter is sitting and say, Hello, Dad. How are you? Hope you had a good day. All right, mate. Good stuff, brother. Give me five. And Daddy will come and tie the shoelace or take the shoes off. And the daughter and the son is sitting. Daddy is standing. And the Lord Jesus says it again. In the book of Revelation, He says, When you come in and the end into my kingdom, I will get up and I will come to you. Coming to welcome you into my kingdom, that means He is coming with a bow. He is so excited, so happy, seeing us into, coming into His kingdom. He will get up from His throne, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He will come bowing before us, and He will say, please take my seat so I can serve you. Jesus served, He served once on earth, and the next one in heaven forever. On earth, John 13. And when, when the Last Supper came, He tied Himself up, He bowed down and washed the feet of His disciples. He was just showing a, a glimpse of what is to come in eternities. He said, I washed your feet here on earth. I bowed before you. You know why? Because I love you more than myself. You're my children. I will do exactly the same thing. I will be the servant of you in my kingdom when you come to your daddy's house. And what is the blessing that God, Jesus, has given us? The blessing is life forevermore. Life forevermore. Will you allow me for five minutes? Yes? No? Can we vote? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> A philosopher by the name of Santayana, who, uh, who was an, uh, an American born but died in Italy in 1953. American-born Italiano. And he passed away in Rome, Italy in 1953. He's a philosopher. He says, to test a caliber of any social, religious, political group, you should always ask this question. To test a caliber like the weight of this organization and this group. How much do they weigh? How much force do they have? How much power? He said, always ask him this question. What do they say about death? If they have an answer to death, you should go and join those people. Because the struggle of the human race, whether Christians or non-Christians, because everybody dies, <laughs> whether they are Christian or not, everybody dies, in the flesh at least. So the struggle of the human race, race from the very beginning of mankind, of our father Adam, till the last person came, everybody tried their hardest to overcome death. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament people, why were they trying their hardest to do good things? Because one of the commandments said, God said, if you be good, if you behave nicely, if you do good things and you make God happy, I will bless you and give you a what? <laughs> a long life. So everybody was trying to do good to gain what? A long life. And that long life, well, one guy lived it 969 years. Ooh, 969 years, man. Okay, imagine this. 
How many grand, 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 grand children did he see? Like imagine you are a grandpa, your age is 969 years, and your family comes. You need the, you need the whole Sydney just to fit your, your family in it. And it's already congested. Got to the outer suburbs, man. Got to Oran Park, Harrington Park, Leppington. They put a train station there. So they lived till the age of 969. That's a lot. But they died. So everyone's problem is death. Jesus says, I put my blessing in Zion. And what is that blessing? Life, not for 900, not for a thousand, not for a million years, forever. What does that mean? You will never die when I bless you. So what is this physical death? Just a transition. When you travel, don't you go through transit? You have to go through transit and you love it when you get through transit because transit gets you to your destiny. Without transit, I can't get there. It's a long flight one way, so I need to go through transit to get to the, my destiny. And when I land in my transit, I say, I made it halfway, bro. A couple of more hours and I'm getting to what I want to get. Yes, and I'm going to meet the, one, the people I love. And you're happy. So don't you love it when you want to get to Jesus, your sweetheart? So what is death, physical death? Transit. I'm going to Dubai. And I'll be transiting there for a few hours. First class, man. And then when you get to Iraq, Bahshiqa, you say, finally, I made it. I'm home, brother. And then your Khalti Nimu comes. Your Auntie Nimu comes with the big Assyrian dolma. And you say, this is what I'm talking about. This is home, bro. So um, God will bless us with eternal life. You go to all the religions of the world with all love and respect. No one has an answer to death. No one. Neither their prophets, nor their good people or holy people, no matter who they are. Muhammad, Buddha, Shintoism, Hinduism, naturalism, you name it. Atheism, all the ism, ism, ism. No one will ever say you will never die. Everybody says, I'm dead meat. You come to, G you come to Christianity. One man that changed the history of, you, of the human race with a, with a very confident statement. He says, you accept me. I promise you, you will never die. And not only that, I don't just say things. I do it. I will die to prove that I'm alive because I will rise from the dead on the third day. And I have eyewitnesses that have, will testify to that from different walks of life, different level of educations, different understandings, different mentalities. Everybody wrote that Jesus was crucified, Jesus was buried, Jesus' tomb is empty, guys. And we saw him after resurrection for 40 days. And even Jewish historians, Moshein, Josephus says that Jesus was crucified and he rose. They're not Christians, they're Jews, enemies, right? Even the enemies testified that Jesus was crucified and rose. Jesus never dies. Allow him to bless you. And that blessing is life forever more, never ending. Because this is the struggle of every human race. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Yet my religion is not saving me. But I don't have a religion to offer you. I offer you one guy called Jesus of Nazareth. You accept him, you will never die. You will live forever and more of it. So it's not only eternal, but it's beyond eternity. You can imagine that. So if you put any number, no matter how humongous that number is, whether it's a billion, zillion, whatever, you put it next to eternity, it is nothing but a zero. I'll finish it off on this. One day, this monk asked uh, an elder one, an older monk, he says, can you just explain to me what eternity is? Or, uh, what does it mean like eternal life, eternal life? He said, my son, I'll say it in this way, in a simple way so we, we can understand. He says, imagine this. You bring a bird, a little bird, and then you ask that bird to move. You ask this bird to move all the grains 
of the sand of this entire world from one place to another place, a grain by a grain. And imagine it will take this bird to move one grain, to move it to the other side of the world, it will take that bird to go and come back one year just to move one grain because you, you need to ask him to move one by one. So imagine asking this bird to moving all the sands of the world from one side to the other, one by one, and if each one takes the bird one year to go and come back, how many years will it take the bird to move all the grains of the sand of this entire world? He says, it's endless, Father. He said, my son, this is the beginning of eternity. This is the glimpse of eternity. That's what Jesus is going to offer us. Be filled with the Lord Jesus. Ask Him to give you the spirit of discernment for you to be able to live a life of unity and harmony. Start with yourself, then go out to your next door neighbor, and then go out to the bigger community. I always say this, and I'm going to finish it 100% on this. There are three kinds of churches. One is the individual church. Two, it is the family church. Three is the universal church. Each church needs to be united. The individual church is you and is made out of three. The family church is made out of three. The universal church is made out of three. It starts with the individual, then going up to the family, and then to the universal. But the, the foundation is, the, is you, the individual. That is the church. What is the three in you? 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we are made out of body, soul, and spirit. There are three. Jesus Christ says, I want you to not unite your body with your spirit. If you cannot find that peace within yourself, how can you offer something that you do not have? How can you talk about something that you do not possess? So unity starts with you first, before you talk about anyone or anything else. If I'm not united with myself, I cannot be united in my family as a member, and I definitely cannot unite as a member in the bigger picture of the universal church. I will always look for trouble. So this church is made out of three, body, soul, and spirit. We need to unite the body and the spirit. The spirit wants one thing, and the body wants something else. How can I unite these two enemies? Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Salt is made out of two ingredients that are fatal, sodium and chlorine. These two make salt. Sodium on its own is uh, poisonous. Chlor on its own is poisonous, and it can lead to death. But when you put these two together, and then with the right measurement, and you put it in that food that you're cooking, the food comes so tasty. The right measurements. Now, the, the master chef knows what the right measurement is. Sodium, let's say, is your body, and chlor is your spirit. Two deadly quantities. If you don't know how to use it, you're going to kill yourself. Give this to the master chef and allow him to use the right measurement so that when people taste you, they taste the sweetness of Christ not poison. We need to unite, my beloveds. So the church, the individual church, myself, body and soul, body and spirit, we're fighting, we're struggling. There is an inner battle. St. Paul says this in, in his epistles to the Romans. He said, the things that I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, I'm doing them, brother. Who's going to save me? I'm nothing but a an ugly person. Who's going to save me from the death of this body? So we need, we need to give this to Christ, our whole being, to Jesus Christ, to unite the, the, the body and the spirit together in harmony. Then the family is made out of three, husband, wife, and children. It's three out of three because the Creator is three in one, divinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He created everything in three. Family is father, uh, husband, wife, father, mother, and children. That's the family church. Universal church is also three. Priest, deacon, congregation. Priest, deacon, congregation. When the three become one, that's where you taste life and more of it. When the three become one, that's where you taste life, more of it. 
when I'm united to Jesus, body and spirit in Jesus Christ, the third person, I live. When the husband and wife, like Joshua says, but for me and my family, we worship the Lord. That is eternal life. John Chrysostom, the patriarch of Constantinople in the 4th century, says, you want to know what God's kingdom is all about? When you see a family, husband, wife, and children worshiping Jesus Christ, this is the kingdom of God in the making. Because God is family. And when you see the church, priest, the clergy, the deacon, and the congregation united all in Jesus Christ, this is heaven on earth, brother. But when you see division in the churches, you tend to walk away. I don't feel like going anymore, man. It's nothing but trouble. Especially these Assyrian stubborn-headed people, man. Uh, they still talk about Bertani. We need to mature in Christ. Stop asking, what are you from? Which tribe are you from? The thing is, we need to change. We need to change by renewing our minds. We need to have the thought of Christ in our heads so we can become a different person, a new person. And I don't need to know where you're from and which family you're from and which tribe you're from and who's your dad. All I need to know is, do you love Jesus? That's what matters. Are you a Christian? Do you love Jesus Christ? You're my brother. You're my family. That's what it is. Psalm 133 is being filled. Psalm 132, empty yourself so that you may be filled by the Lord Jesus. And Psalm 134, which is the last session to next Friday, God willing, it's going to be all about blessing and praising the Lord Jesus. Because if He fills you up, what else are you going to do but thank Him, thank Him, thank Him forever and ever. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Let's stand for the uh, finishing prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you now and forevermore. Amen.